Amen. Good morning, Asbury Church. Oh, come on. Good morning, Asbury Church. I mean, the video should have got you more excited than that. All right, just so you know, we are a part of the Global Methodist Church. You're going to hear a lot about that today. We're going to be talking about missions today. We're going to be talking about missions next Sunday. We're going to talk about several things. But before we get into all of that, we want to begin this morning with a song. And in, in Methodism over the years, the, the first song always was this. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. All right? Now, Charles Wesley wrote this song a year after he had uh, received salvation. And he wrote this uh, celebrating that first year of salvation. And he said, if I had a thousand tongues, I would praise Christ with them all. Well, he wrote 18 verses. We'll sing a few of them this morning. Uh, one of these days, we'll just do all 18 of them because the theology is so good. But we're going to start this morning by singing, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Please stand as we sing together.
God's people said, amen. amen, amen, you may be seated, amen, thank you for that, such a great song as we sing together, and uh, whether it's the 18 verses of the hymn, whether it's the few verses along with this bridge today, all, all wonderful, hallelujah. Just a few things, uh, those of you who are online, we welcome you this morning as well. Uh, I don't know, we, we had a video at the beginning, we have some copyright issues with that, and so uh, we were not uh, at least supposed to show that online by virtue of the copyright. Some of that may have snuck in. If not, uh, there will be a link on our website. You can go take a look at that later. But for those of you here present, uh, you were able to see that and see some of the things that took place, and you'll hear much more about that. As we, uh, as we talk about and, and fill you in a little bit about what God has been doing in the life of God's calling for us here in the life of the church. One other thing as we move forward, uh, we have some, with technology, we're bouncing back and forth between what's called ProPresenter, the software that does this work, and PowerPoint. And uh, I told them, I said, they're going to have a heck of a time trying to follow me. So I have a clicker. <laughs> All right. So at, at times when we make some changes and stuff, then I'm going to govern it from here. But I uh, appreciate our, our guys upstairs and in the back uh, helping us out as we move forward. Just two things quickly. On the very front, when we talk about can I get a witness, you might see that there's a, there's a guy, as we're talking about the convening conference, as we stand on the Word of God, uh, Ryan Barnett from Texas, he got up and he shared. He was overseeing the Constitution Committee, and he said, I would start simply by saying this, that the Constitution for a new global denomination is heavy work, but we are encouraged by the knowledge of this, that while it serves as a temporal foundation for the work, and life of the church, there is another book that truly guides our life together. All right? It needs no second, and it is beyond the vote of man. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen and amen and amen. We stand on that, and we celebrate in that today. Also, one other thing, quickly, uh, this last week you should have received a letter in the mail along with a, a card for a faith promise for next week for, for missions. We've been doing this over the years with COVID and disaffiliation and things the last couple of years. Uh, we, we, it, it, we just weren't able to do it the same way. Uh, we're back in, in a flow again. And so we want to be thinking about that, be praying about this. This is what uh, we can offer towards missions. It helps us budget for missions for the year to come. And so if you would pray over that, uh, this is not uh, the, the tithe, this is for missions, uh, and so part of that may go towards your tithe, but however you choose to, to work that, uh, bring those cards next week, and we'll offer those to the Lord as a part of our gift to Him uh, to reach the world for Christ this coming week. So these are the things uh, that are before us today, and uh, I want to just uh, have a word of prayer, and then I want to lead us in somewhat of an interesting call to worship. All right, join me in prayer. God, we give you thanks for the day you've given us today. We give you thanks for the privilege of gathering in this house. We give you thanks for going before us today and preparing us for a word that you have for us as we just share, as we report what, back to the, to the people what you are doing across the world through the Global Methodist Church. We're thankful for that. We offer our time to you now, Lord, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Often in the 8 o'clock service, we have something called a call to worship. It's an invitation. When, when I say good morning, that's not a call to worship. That's just a good morning type of thing. A call to worship is in, to invite you into worship. Now this, what I share with you, is just a little bit different because John Wesley had a word for the people called Methodist in the 1700s, and I believe it carries over to today. And so, in a way, receive this as the call to worship, and the words are on the screen, and I'll, I'll read this to you, okay? He says this. You might remember some of you. I am not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist either in Europe or America, if he was alive today, or he'd say, or across the world. But I am afraid, lest they should have only exist as a dead sect, having the form of religion without the power and this undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast both the doctrine, the spirit, and the discipline with which they first set out. These were words, prophetic words, I believe, 
that Wesley shared with the people called Methodists in his day and with us as well today, that it would behoove us to follow the warning and to follow the challenge that is before us that we stay and hold fast to the doctrine, the teaching, the spirit, and the discipline with which uh, Methodism first set out. I want to share with you uh, some scripture this morning. As, as mentioned, I'm looking at the 8 o'clock, so sorry guys. I wondered what you were doing. He wondered. All of a sudden I got to thinking, I have another song in here somewhere. Um, we have a song that we want to sing because we're talking about missions and so forth. We're talking about salvation. Going into all the world to bring salvation, the good news of Christ to others. So I'm going to invite you uh, to stand as we sing this song, Mighty to Save. Yeah, this song is going to say in the chorus, Savior, he can move the mountains, he is mighty to save. And there was a time in the New Testament, the people were living under a corrupt religious system, a corrupt political system. It was depressing. It was a mess. It felt hopeless. And Jesus basically looks at this mountain that, that represents all of that. And he says, hey, like if I wanted to, essentially, at the drop of a hat, I could throw this whole thing into the sea. So he's, he's telling us, he's got it under control. But, but for now, have faith in what I teach you. Love God, love people. That's what's going to change the world. And someday in his time, he's going to make that change. He, he's going to bring his kingdom. So let's, let's turn to the God who can move mountains with this song. Everyone needs compassion Love that's never failing Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of a Savior The hope of nations Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever, author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave
seated. Amen. Thank you. And there, there's a lot of things that are going on different today. So any of our kids right now are being dismissed to Children's Church. Okay, so if any of you kids are here uh, and, and want to go to Children's Church, go that away and they'll take care of you. Thank you very much. All right. And I appreciate uh, everybody uh, on the team here is being flexible when I'm messing up with the order of service. And you don't know it, but they do, and they go, he's at it again. But it's all good. It's all fine, and, and God can handle it just fine. So uh, I want to share with you a little bit this morning uh, from, from the good book, all right? From Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And I'm going to pick up on verses, <clears throat> verses 6 through 8. And you'll recall that Luke is speaking here about his former book. He's speaking about how Jesus appeared to the many over the 40 days and how Jesus gave the command uh, to, to not leave Jerusalem but wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's more than the water, but the gift of the Spirit that will come and dwell in you. And so he's speaking to those around him. And then he says this in verse 6. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord... Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive what? Power. When what? The Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. All right, you look at a passage like that, and Jesus is with those who are following, more than just 12 around him, and they're trying to sort it all out. And after, you know, he's given these words, wait for the Spirit and all of this, and the first question they ask him, yeah, but are you going to restore us back? You know, are you going to defeat Rome? Are you, are you going to help us to be victors? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And, you know, as, as I said in the first service, if I'm Dallas Jenkins and I'm doing the chosen, you know, at this point, I have Jesus just rolling his eyes. You know, like, you guys, that, that's not what I'm talking about. Yes, that's going to happen, but that's not what's the important thing right now. I don't even know when all this stuff is going to happen. But I do know this. He says, you're going to be filled with power. And you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You're going to have the dunamis, the dynamite explosive power of the Spirit to do the work of the kingdom. And in the process, he says this. You're going to be my witnesses. A witness is one who declares that which he or she has seen or heard or experienced. And you're going to do it here, and you're going to do it there, and you're going to do it there, and you're going to do it to the ends of the earth. Why? Because they have not seen, nor have they heard, nor have they experienced what I have brought to you. The kingdom of God has arrived. Thank you. I was waiting for my wife to help me on that. But the reality is Jesus was trying to help them understand something extremely important. Yeah, they asked a question about restoration of the, of the kingdom to Israel, 
But he's saying, wrong question. Here's what's important. All that restoration is not going to happen unless we get the word out. Unless we get the word out. Right here, Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria and beyond. You know, Wichita, Sedgwick County, Kansas, U.S., world. That's what he's talking about. If we're going to talk about missions, we've got a God who is a missionary God because he is a sending God who sends us into the world to share the good news. That world may be just across the street, maybe at the, at the office. May, who knows where it may happen to be? But that we're called to be witnesses for Jesus. Witnesses for Jesus. Well, let me share some things from this past, well, a couple weeks ago now, it was. And we'll see, uh, there'll be, what we have is movement from pro presenter to PowerPoint. So that's where we're at upstairs. So I'm ready for that first slide, and then I'll govern it from here. Ah, how I love when a plan comes together. So what we have is this incredible theme of the General Conference in Costa Rica, just uh, starting on the 20th. And so, so the world will know. What are they going to know? That God has established His kingdom through His Son, Jesus Christ. And He shall reign forever and ever and ever. But we've got to get the word out. And so the theme the whole week was so the world will know. Now, those of you online are just going to be seeing pictures for a little bit. You're not going to see me, which saves you a lot of grief. Those of you here, I'm sorry, but uh, you're going to see both. And so this theme, and it was tied into all that we did throughout the week. And it's tied into all that we're about even here at Asbury Church. Now, we were capably led by a man named Keith Boyette. I remember receiving a call back in 2016. Would you be willing, from Walter Fenton, would you be willing to sign as a charter member of something at that time called the Wesleyan Covenant Association? Any of you remember that? Well, it just so happened that a man named Keith Boyette was retiring from, from his work, from ministry and so forth. <laughs> Little did he know he was retiring into leading us in the WCA, through the GMC, through all the grunt and groaning, groan planning and so forth to get us to where we were a week or so ago. And in it, you can see, notice this, this is really cool. Look at that. Yeah, you like that? We envision a church that welcomes every person regardless of the extent of brokenness of sin in our lives and offers God's redeeming grace and transforming love. Now, you know, Keith Boyette, he was the, the person called for the, just the right time. Just the right time. And so Keith spoke to us. He opened up the conference. He formally welcomed us. And at that moment, as he welcomed us, as we began to, began to move into worship and so forth, there was this incredible joy. There was emotion that I can't even describe to you. You just had to be there. And, and all these people, us included, folks, all these people who had worked so hard to get us to this point were overcome by emotion and really the power of the Holy Spirit. And there were people physically shaking and weeping. The, the chair of the Transitional Leadership uh, Council was sitting beside me. She's from Oklahoma. And she was just weeping. And I grabbed her and I said... We made it. We made it. And Bishop, Scott, um, Bishop uh, Mark Webb, at the beginning, he reminded us that we are committed, when we are committed to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and the authority of Scripture in every area of our life, we will live out an Orthodox Christian faith in a Methodist way that will change us. And God will use us to change the world. Oh, man. God's doing a work. Well, if we go back to the slide, we had a, uh, oops, let me kick this off. Let me back. There we, oops, there we go. I just bounced. There we go. Thank you. So we have a delegation here. This is the Heartland delegation that went. 
Every annual conference had a delegation that went to represent you, to represent uh, people from the various annual conferences and so forth. We have six clergy and six uh, laity along with some alternates. Lots of time spent into this preparation time, the time during the week, long days. You'll hear more about that after a bit. But so blessed to be a part of the delegation of 300 plus delegates, plus volunteers, plus prayer teams, plus, plus, plus. So many people that were there. It, it was amazing. And, and the thing is, we, were, we are truly global. When we, I know many people got nervous about the word global Methodist, but we are global. That we, we go to the globe and we're made up of people from the globe, from Africa and the Philippines and, and Korea and Central America, Eastern Europe, even Texas. You know, they think they're their own country. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta be careful with them Texans. But, uh, you know, and, and so while we were meeting, and I failed to mention this in the first service, but while we were meeting, we received word of acceptance, legal presence in Mexico, in Mozambique, in Zimbabwe, in Malawi, and Zim Zambia, and Peru. The Holy Spirit is connecting us all. We are, and the communication that took place was a communication that came about because of the work of the Holy Spirit. We are global. So if you take a look, yeah, I'm hoping here. There we go. We, you can see these two on the upper left, the left, the upper left guy, he, he's a newly elected bishop. The other is already a bishop, Johanna. And in various people from Korea uh, and, the, and, the, and the country of Texas right here. Uh, <laughs> and we have, uh, he was here for church a few weeks back. He's from Fiji, Zach. And here was, we were downtown and so took a, a, pers a picture of a person from Costa Rica and how we had ministry to the Costa Ricans and so people from all over the globe that we're in ministry with. And through all of that, we came together and what we did, ah, it's not happy upstairs. What we did next was worship. Um, and we worshiped. I'm telling you, it was incredible. There was a palpable sense of, of the Holy Spirit in and throughout from the get go to the get gone and the get going the spirit is still alive and well and we're so excited about that and we're so excited to be a part of this and so what I'd like to do is invite Susan up here for a, mo a moment or so as uh, we had a prayer team as you're fully aware Susan and Allison uh, were both there both are going to share a little bit this morning and so Susan is going to share with us right now Good morning, Asbury Church. It is so good to be back here with you all. Just, I'm going to start with a few details to kick everything off. So we had a full-time on-site prayer team. Um, we had two teams. One was the full-time, one was the altar. And the full-time prayer team was made up of 27 individuals, including Allison, um, another leader named Laura, and myself. And uh, we had eight Costa Ricans in that number who were part of the church down there in Costa Rica, the Methodist church that partnered with us in Costa Rica to help pull all of this off. Because folks, glory to God, what normally takes four years was pulled together in 18 months. And it went well. It wasn't thrown together. It went really well. And so the full-time prayer team would get there at 6 6.15 in the morning. We were one of the first wave of volunteers to arrive, and then we did not leave until the last group meeting left the building because it was our vision from the beginning to make sure that everything was covered in prayer, bathed in prayer, no matter when they were meeting. So it was long days. Um, we were split into two teams to help cover that time. You either had a seven-hour shift or a 10-hour shift. And folks, seven hours of prayer is like 14, <laughs> and 10 hours of prayer is like 20 of work. They were long, long days. But it was so easy in one way to do, tiring for the physical body, but easy to be a part of because the Holy Spirit was so, so present, so thick, guiding us in everything we did and we said um, we got to consecrate our speakers who are going to be on the platform, worship team members, pray for people's concerns, you know, things going back on at home, and they were down in Costa Rica, couldn't be there. We had folks who did get sick while they were in Costa Rica to be praying for. 
um, just praying for the business. We were prayer walking inside. We were prayer walking outside. We were just anything and everything that could be prayed for. We, we were in the middle of that as the full-time prayer team. And then we would have um, these glorious outbreaks of worship or also planned worship where we had altar prayer team members assist us in prayer and anointing and uh, a lot of anointing oil flowed. It was, it was really good. Um, so those 60 members were delegates and alternates who wanted to be a part of prayer but obviously couldn't step away from the business of the church to be on the full-time prayer team. And so whenever worship happened and we needed extras, they jumped in. And both teams, folks, were such, such a blessing. We even had one young man from the Democratic Republic of Congo who couldn't make it at the last minute because of visa issues. He changed his entire schedule so that he was up and awake and praying with us in the prayer room and sleeping whenever we were sleeping. So he was up in the middle of the night just to participate in prayer and be a part of that. And, and we're so thankful because his dedication to prayer and our dedication to prayer means the Holy Spirit bound us together. And, and it was a fabulous experience. Now, we would also like to thank everyone and acknowledge everyone who participated in the 40 days of prayer and fasting leading up to this, the 12 days of prayer during it. There was also an online prayer room that you could take an hour and be in prayer with us. And so we believe and agree that the extent of prayer cover had a direct impact on how well the conference went and the unity that was felt among the gathering of so many nations. The prayer room had a constant stream of people going in and out, and we believe that's because the Holy Spirit was so present. Things could feel chaotic, but there was still this calm and this peace that could be found in the prayer room that had very little to do with those of us on the ground, but everything to do with what God was doing among us and through us and with us. Um, there was one event on the very last day. The very last day, we circled up the whole prayer team. We, we had everyone present, as many as possible anyway. Our Costa Ricans, everybody. And prayer broke out in Spanish and Slovakian and Korean and Tagalog, which is the Philippines' native language. And we didn't have to worry about when we were saying amen or glory to God or anything like that because you just knew. The Holy Spirit directed the whole prayer. And it was such a beautiful vision of what God wants for the Global Methodist Church. We're global to be united and not worrying about what the other person's saying because the Holy Spirit's in the middle of it. And so if we don't quite understand, it's going to be okay. It's really going to be okay. It was, it was just so cool. Um, my childhood friend, and she's also one of my band mates, not band like musical, but band like we have our spiritual bands. And I was telling her all about this, and as she was praying and giving God the glory for what was going on down there in Costa Rica, she referred to Revelation chapter 1, and she said that she was so encouraged that God continues to tend his lampstands, which are the bodies of Christ worldwide. God is still doing a new thing among us. You know, do we perceive it? Are we going to be a part of it? So my greatest um, personal moment with God was a reminder that you don't have to be at a special worship service. You don't have to be at something planned to experience an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God is with us 24-7. He says that throughout the Old and the New Testament. My favorite reference to that is Matthew 28, 20, where Jesus says, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You don't have to be in church like this. You don't have to set aside a perfect thing and have it all ordered in a service. The Holy Spirit is already here with us, always. All we have to do is step out of what is occupying our time and step into what God is doing around us constantly to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. We don't, we don't have to wait, folks. We don't have to get hung up. It doesn't just happen in Wilmore, Kentucky at Asbury University. It doesn't just happen at a global conference in Costa Rica. It's happening even now, right where we are. And we just get to, isn't it amazing that we get to lean in 
and participate in that? Will we choose to participate in that? Because it can be a daily occurrence. I was, I was really upset with Allison because she was the one who was there for some of these little outpourings that were going on, and she'll tell you a little bit more about that. And I was at the hotel. I was like, dang it, I'm missing out. And God's like, I'm right here. <laughs> you haven't missed a thing. Step in. And so I do ask again, will we choose to lean in and participate with God, or will we continue to sit on the outside looking for the so-called right opportunity? I, for one, do not want to wait. I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, and I want to spend all my days actively participating in what he is doing around me. I am not perfect, none of us are, and we will not always get this right. But if our eyes are on God alone, then we won't miss what he's doing and we won't miss his return whenever that is. Will you please pray with me? Father God, we give you all the glory and thanks and praise. We are so humbled by the thickness of your presence in Costa Rica. We get that there is absolutely no way that all those people from all those places could come together and be unified and agreeing on things without the Holy Spirit's activity. So, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us when we shy away from looking for what you're doing. Forgive us when we get so caught up in our days and our agendas and our plans that we don't look for you, that we don't see you. Turn our hearts back towards you, Lord. Help us to lean in. Help us to remember that it's not our work, but it's for your glory. And we want that. We want that for everyone around us. We want that for ourselves and our families and our churches. We want that for our city and our nation and our world. And so, Lord, we choose today to participate in all you are already doing among us by the power of your Holy Spirit. For your glory, others gain in our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. When we were getting started on the first day and having worship, we were led by a guy from Houston named Sterling Allen, uh, he actually put together and edited a, a hymnal already for the Global Methodist Church, and uh, that was officially available that day in an official commemoration for the convening conference. And as he was leading, and as we began to start together that day, uh, his daughter, 10-year-old, uh, 10-year-old Anna Grace, got up and began as we all were standing, began to lead us in the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed. You know it, I believe. And she began to read, and people were standing, and there was no one whispering. Because people actually believe it. They believe in what it is that we are saying in the Apostles' Creed. It's a declaration without apology of what we believe. So I'm going to invite you to stand as we share together in the Apostles' Creed. Some of you maybe haven't said it for a while. I don't know if I'm running this or if you're... There it is. Thank you upstairs. And so, this is important, all right? This is what we believe as we gather together. Let us unite in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. All right. Now, in the first service, we sang the glory of Patri. Can we do that? It's, the words aren't up there, I don't think. But I bet, yeah, they are up there. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Glo glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Amen. Ah, you got to love it. You may be seated. That's also to help us understand what we believe. I'm going to invite Allison up here. I've got a picture here. I don't know if you can do that upstairs. There it is. Uh, Susan and Allison, as you know, were a part of the prayer team. And uh, we were all at different places at different times, but I caught them one day and said, let's take a quick picture. So uh, here it is, and here she is, and so she's going to share a few words with us. He said a few words, but, you know. Very few. <laughs> he, he said in the first service that he has a shepherd's crook, and I said, but I have the microphone. And he said, well, but, you know, upstairs they can turn it off. And I said, but I have an outside voice. So, you know. I win. Um, <laughs> um, Susan and I, um, it was just so much fun, and it was a privilege that we both were able to be the on-site prayer leaders in Costa Rica at the general conference. And um, Susan sort of explained to you kind of how this was set up, and um, we were on different shifts. So if she had the morning shift, I had the afternoon shift, and vice versa. And so we did not see each other all that often, but um, it was kind of fun because she did have different um, experiences with her team and, and I had a different team and all that sort of thing. But one thing that we did um, kind of, we, we all sort of, I think, went into this thinking that there would be at some point sort of an, a huge outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Um, even though we kept telling each other, we kept telling our team and, and so many other people, this is not like anything you've ever done before. We, we just kept telling each other, this is going to be different. You know, we, nobody has ever been to a convening general conference. Nobody. So <clears throat> just don't go in with any expectations. And yet there I was with an expectation. Um, but w the thing, I, one of the things that surprised me was there was no whoosh at one time of the Holy Spirit. There was no massive one-time outpouring like you might see at a, you know, at a retreat or um, a special event if you've been to New Room or if you went to the Asbury outpouring or whatever. There was no one time. It kept coming in waves. The Holy Spirit kept pouring out on us at different times in different places. And um, one time I remember there was each morning, somebody would give a morning devotional um, to the entire plenary before everybody would, you know, break up into legislative sessions or whatever. And um, this one morning, um, a pastor from the Philippines, his name was Luther O'Connor, and I mean, he gave just an awesome message. And it really was more like what you would hear on a Sunday morning, but he gave just a really powerful message. And the next thing you know, everybody had gone forward. I mean, everybody was forward. Nobody was expecting it. There was no word to the prayer team, hey, get ready, there's going to be an altar call, nothing. But whoosh, everybody was forward. They were on their faces, they were on their knees. You know, people were just crying out to the Lord. And, you know, the worship team's like, ooh, what do we do now? And the altar team's going, what do we do now? And, but that's, that's the kind of thing that happened. And they had to push back the time for the start of the, plen of the legislative sessions because, hey, you have people on their faces and people are around the side of the room praying. And that's what the Holy Spirit did the whole time. You just never knew how this was going to go. But we were not the ones running this. The Holy Spirit was in charge from the beginning. So that was wonderful. And... Another thing that, and this is probably one of the things that's really going to stick with me, the way we had this with our teams was people could be praying in the prayer room 
or they could, as Susan said, be walking up and down the halls. Um, our teams, team members would be praying outside the legislative sessions, um, and a lot of times they were praying in the main conference room, but we had agreed, and everybody was on the same page, we did not pray for outcomes. We did not pray for certain types of legislation to pass and others not to pass. We did not pray for certain people to be elected to certain positions. We only prayed for God's will to be done. That and the name of Jesus to be exalted. That was it. And so as we prayed in the back of the conference room, you would see people walking back and forth. You would see people on their knees, sometimes on their faces. And, and the conference, the legislation sessions were going on, the plenary session was going on, but the prayer team was constantly back and forth, on their faces, on their knees, walking back and forth, just praying, Jesus, 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 come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. God's will be done. God's, that's all they were praying the entire time. That's all. And what really stuck with me throughout all of this was the massive amount of power that comes when the body of Christ prays in unison and with one purpose in mind for the glory of God. That's all we were praying. We were not praying anyone's agenda. We were not praying prayer requests in that context. We were only praying for the glory of God. And the power that comes when the body of Christ prays for the glory of God alone, it, it's just incredible. And that really had a huge, huge impact on me. Now, as Susan said, we did pray for, for people and we prayed for needs, but this is the second part of that is, is there were three distinct times that I remember praying for people, but I, and they, and I would say, you know, is there something I could pray for you for? And, and they told me, but in praying for them, I did not pray specifically for that concern. I, I just leaned into the Holy Spirit and I prayed as the Spirit led me. So I, this would be kind of called praying prophetically. I prayed as I was led by the Spirit, and, and that need was included in it, but I did not pray from, from myself. I prayed as the Spirit led me, and, and all three times as I finished, the person was crying. So I was like, oh, yay, okay, another person cried, yay. Um, so, but that's how I knew I was praying as the Spirit led me, rather than just praying what I thought the person needed. And, and it was so powerful, and the person's like, yeah, that was great, that was awesome, thank you, you know, and, and again, when we pray according to the Spirit, rather than what we think needs praying, changes everything. So, I, you know, when we pray this way, it changes everything, and there's so much more power. And here's the thing, that's not something that only happened in Costa Rica. We can say, well, gee, that was great. Wish we could have it here. Guess what? We can. Because if you have the Holy Spirit in you, it's the same Holy Spirit that was in Costa Rica. And we can pray it here as the body of Christ because we can pray God's will here. We can pray that together corporately, and you can pray for other needs in the same way that I prayed for other needs. You can pray according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. You can pray in a group for God's will to be done and for the name of Jesus to be exalted. And that same power is available to you just as it was to all of us there. So I'm encouraging you to lean into the Holy Spirit when you pray. Ask for the glory of God to be revealed. Ask for the name of Jesus to be exalted and see what happens. The power of God is available to all of us Let's lean into it. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you. One of the things in light of prayer was if you get a chance to go on YouTube on So the World Will Know, which is the, the, the theme of the conference, you can work your way down and find what's called the Concert of Prayer. They had, a, they had the first day what they called a Concert of Prayer that was led by persons from all across the world, various representatives from all across the world, it was extremely powerful in the languages that they spoke, uh, leading us either in song or in prayer, and it was 
very, very powerful, powerful time. So uh, that was amazing. Well, as we move into just a few more slides, I want, I want to talk about uh, this guy right here. That's Jordan McFall, all right? Now, you got to understand the message that was preached that morning in that devotion by Luther uh, from the Philippines set the table, absolutely set the table for the work that we were going to do that day. Because Jordan was the chairperson of the, of the Episcop Episcopal a committee, which was the, the group determining the process to, uh, to elect bishops and who, how many bishops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This was probably the most, uh, I don't want to say controversial, but there were multiple uh, ideas about how this should be done. And I'm telling you folks, this guy right here, Jordan McFall, he led, he's younger than my oldest two boys. He led the conference in ways that are historic. Historic. And it, it was incredible, the work that not only he, but his team did. And it was, uh, it was one of those things where he led it to where we came to an agreement where even those who didn't want to necessarily go a particular way said, in light of of uh, the, what we desire for unity for the conference, we're not going to file a minority report. We're, we're going to work together so that we can move forward. That doesn't happen. I've been to three general conferences before. That, has, that doesn't happen. And so they, they interviewed Jordan, and he, he just said, as Paul mentions in Ephesians 4.3, our committee worked to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I witnessed what truly holy conferencing should look like today in amazing ways. That is exactly what Wesley had in mind when he used the language holy conferencing. That when, when we would get together with different ideas, you would pray through it and you would come to consensus or at least to a unity. The two words that describe all that happened to me for me was unity and celebration. And so I show, show this, if you'd put the slide back up, there, there's Jordan. And so we moved into a time of election of bishops. I don't have time to tell you how that all happened, but by, by, uh, by, by the plenary vote and so forth, we came to vote for six uh, uh, bishops for two years until we had the next general conference. This was a limited agenda general conference. These will serve uh, part-time, but what happened was... Uh, now, does anybody get this picture? Does anybody get it? If you have a Catholic background, you should get this. Because when a pope is elected, white smoke comes up from the chapel, okay? So somebody made a meme of white, white smoke coming up from the conference center in Costa Rica. The bishops have been elected. In less than four hours, all six were elected. That was a miracle. I've been around before when it took 30 ballots before we got one election in 2016. It's a miracle. And so they were elected. Here's the, here's the six that were elected, uh, or not. I don't know what's going on, but uh, there we go. These, the, these, these were elected. The one on the left, he is from the Democratic Republic of Congo, Kimba Everesti, and the next one to him is John Pena Alta. All right? And then, uh, well, I'm going to stop there. The accusation against the GMC was, all you are is a country club for the old white men. Let me tell you what happened. The first three bishops that were elected, two were from Africa, and the next one was a woman, Carolyn Moore on the right, second from the end there. Those were the first three. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so God was doing a work, and then the one next to, next, the third one right here, this is Leah Hitty Gregory. Uh, she's from that other nation known as Texas. And then actually, strangely enough, Kenneth Livingston is also from Houston, uh, serving as an Afri African-American. We're thrilled to have him on board. Carolyn Moore, I mentioned already. And then Jeff Greenway from the Allegheny West, which is Ohio and so forth. These six were elected and are going to serve with three, with three of them uh, having the opportunity to go on and serve after 2026. Three of them will not. This is not a lifetime thing. This is, not, this is to serve right now. And so what happened was, when we had the commissioning service, Bishop Mark Webb, he is an amazing, amazing man from the Northeast, really relational, 
loves Jesus, does an incredible job of, of presiding. He led the commissioning service. As, as he spoke to the bishop, he was speaking to all of us, but then as he turned to the bishops, bishops elect, he told them, these are my words, he said, if, this is not about you. This is not about you. And then to use his words, he did say, this is not about prestige. This is not about honor, your honor. This is not about climbing the ladder, those types of things. He said this, this is about service. And you are called and commissioned to serve. And so we were thrilled in hearing that and how passionate he was. Well, because things had gone on a little bit, we still had a little work to do after the commissioning service. We were hoping to be done by now, but we had some elections for nominations for uh, various committees and so forth. So as you see in this next slide, uh, you'll see that, yes, we did vote on some things, okay? Uh, long story short, we came together. We were able to come up with the names to lead us in the various commissions and agencies, committees and agencies, to lead us for these coming years and so forth as we move forward. In essence, it is no longer a provisional book of doctrine and discipline. We have a doctrine and discipline. We have a constitution. We are not a provisional Heartland Conference. We are the Heartland Conference. We are the Global Methodist Church. It's no longer provisional. It's like Jesus said, it is done. It is amazing work that was taking place. This was absolutely Holy Spirit-led. There's no way this could have happened any other way. And so there was discussion about mission and vision, and you all know about that, but there was, in light of who we are as, as Wesleyan Christians, with our Methodism background and who we are, there was a tweak done to the mission statement to reflect that. And here's what it says. Uh, the Global Methodist Church exists to make disciples of Jesus Christ, and here, this is distinctly Wesleyan, and spread scriptural holiness across the globe. In other words, just because you get saved doesn't mean it's over. It means you continue in your growth and the spreading of God's love and the growing in Christ and the sanctification process till you become more and more and more like Jesus. That's the intent. And so in two years with that mission in mind, the intent is to meet in Africa, Central Africa. I don't know what that means for me. I'm praying about that. Uh, but I just know this much, that God has been at work in an incredible, incredible, incredible way. And I'm thrilled and privileged to be a part of it. And I'm thrilled and privileged to be one of those who was on the ground when it started to see it get to this point. That's amazing. I didn't lose it at all in the first service, and I almost lost it now. But it's, it's absolutely supernatural amazing. And so in our time together, are you playing this for us? Yeah. Yeah. In our time together, every day there were these moments when the Holy Spirit would work and we would just break out in the doxology. It would serve us right if we broke out in the doxology. Stand up, if you will. Before we have communion, we need to sing this. Here we go. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to move into a time of communion. It just makes sense. By the way, in the life of the church, actually the church universal, this is World Communion Sunday. And, uh, you know, sadly, over the years, the church has divided uh, over, the issue, over the sacrament of communion when the communion is, is meant to bring us together. 
So we need to be working on that and be mindful of that. As we do so, let us be mindful that we give thanks to God for His goodness, His blessings. And so just a reminder before you leave today that we give of God's tithes and our offerings in light of how great and awesome and good God is. There are plates in the back and online. You can do that and so forth. So I remind you of that uh, today. So we come before the table today. Those of you at home, if you'd get your elements ready. So we come to the table today. As I said, one of the most important things I think that I experienced and felt was, uh, took place was the unity that, that happened. The unity of this body of Christ from across the world to share in God's goodness. And that's what Jesus was trying to help his disciples understand and, and experience the unity they could have in him by virtue of their faith in him as he shared with them uh, this holy meal. And so the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to each and every one of them, reminding them, this is my body, which is given for you, and to do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And at that supper, a little later, he passed the cup, and in the passing of the cup, he shared with them, even though they didn't understand it all. But this is my blood, which is shed for you, and to do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Those of you at home, if you'd prepare yourselves for, uh, for communion, I'd invite us all to pray, if you will. God, we come before you. We give you thanks. We give you praise. You are so good. We thank you for your grace and your mercy that's been extended to us. God, we are not worthy to come to your table, and yet because of what you have done, Lord Jesus, your work on the cross, and our faith in you that, that makes us worthy to come. We can come boldly to the throne. We can come boldly to the table out of gratitude. So we offer ourselves to you just as you have offered yourself to us. We pray it and ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you at home, if you take the bread, if you take the cup, be mindful of the body given for you, and the blood of Christ shed for you, take and eat and drink. And then for all of us that are here today, you don't have to be a member of Asbury Church. Jesus says, as they would say in the South, y'all come. All y'all come. He's inviting us all to come that we might experience his grace and his mercy, his forgiveness, his salvation even. If you've never said yes to Jesus, this is the day that the Lord has made. Today is the day of your salvation. Receive what he has for you. All are invited. Two stations who come in the middle, go to the side. You'll receive the, the bread and dip into the cup and stop in prayer. Return to your seats. But all are invited to come. Please.
was an appropriate, an appropriate offer or a song during our during our time. Holy, holy, holy. Thank you. So good. All right, Nathan, lead us. Please stand as we close together. Yeah, let's sing uh, together. We're going to sing "Here I Am, Lord." It says, "I hear you calling, and I will go." So let's sing this together. You know, the Lord may hold you to that this week. Because you just said, here I am, Lord. And it, it actually, the, the words are, is it I? It said, it is I. But is it I? And the question is, is it me? And you know what he's saying? Yes, it's you. It's you. It's you, whether it's across the street. It's you, whether it's in the office. It's you, wherever you may happen to be. All right? So, uh, to the ends of the earth. Personal privilege, if you would pray for me, I begin as a presiding elder today to the, the charge conferences for the churches, so I have two a day now for the next six weeks on Sundays after church, so if you'd pray for me, I need a little stamina, and then just a quick trip, because the Grand Poobah, Jordan McFall, is sending me to Mississippi for a couple days, and I'll be back Friday, so uh, after that, maybe I can ride horse more or something, I don't know, but... Uh, be that as it may, wherever we may be going, however it is that we may be getting there, let it be that we would be witnesses for the Lord. Why? So the world will know. Go in peace. Amen.